We're here at CPAC 2018. I'm Rob Bluey, Editor-in-Chief of The Daily Signal. We're joined by an all-star team of experts on budget and spending. We have Steve Moore with us. Uh, Hi, he's a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Romina Baccia, who is our Deputy Director of the Rowe Institute, and Jonathan Bidlack from the Coalition to Reduce Spending. Now, you all are just coming to us from a, a panel discussion you did on the issue of spending and budget and other things. And we have just come off this debate here in the in the U.S. Congress, where I think all of us are probably somewhat depressed about <laughs> what they what they did. Steve, let me begin with you. What was your message to the attendees here at CPAC? Well, it's funny, Romina asked each of us to give one word answer to what we thought about the budget deal, and I think I used the word disgrace. Uh, you know, it was a disgrace. It was a real setback, and now we've got to figure out how to get back on a path towards, you know, budget caps and spending restraint. You know, we, we solved half the half the problem with the tax cut. The tax cut for conservatives is one of the great victories of all time, but um, we haven't got the spending under control. And so that I think that's gonna be a huge focus for heritage over the next few years. Now how do we deal with the out of control spending? So let me ask both of you, how do we do that? Yeah, yeah one of the other words that came up was counterproductive. People mm -hmm. are rightfully celebrating this major tax reform, and that's a good thing. But the problem is if we don't get spending under control, these tax cuts could be very short-lived. So what do we need to do now? Part of our panel was to talk about where do we go from here? How do we drain the swamp now after the budget deal? And we still have a very powerful tool in the budget resolution. Congress is still required under law to pass a budget this year. The budget deal is separate. The budget resolution is what they need to do. And only if they pass a budget resolution can they trigger reconciliation. And reconciliation can then allow us to um, fix entitlement spending, to actually start cutting spending for those programs, or even just reducing the growth in those programs that are driving our debt, that's health care. And there are great proposals in the president's budget, so we have a good starting point for Medicare and Medicaid. And what a lot of people don't realize, some of those proposals were also in President Obama's budget. So they should be bipartisan. Uh, all we need for Congress to do now is pass a budget, trigger this powerful fiscal tool called reconciliation, and begin Begin to cut spending. Well, and reconciliation, of course, is important because you wouldn't have been able to move forward on the tax cuts uh, were, were it not for that. So, Jonathan, what was your message to the panel today? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a missed opportunity, but it's not our only opportunity. You know, the reality is we all know there are plenty of places to cut. There are plenty of things that government does that they shouldn't be doing, and there are plenty of things that I think a lot of Republicans could get behind. So, um, we just need to keep pushing that message going forward. We've dealt with our, our tax issues. Now we need to focus on spending if we want those tax, those tax cuts to actually be long-lasting. We hear so much about the, the mandatory spending being the, the key driver of some, so many of the, uh, the challenges that we face. So, so what specific solutions, uh, before we came on air, you were talking about Social Security. Are, are, is there a momentum now, do you feel, among conservatives to move ahead with some of these uh, solutions that for so long conservatives and organizations like Heritage have been, have been pressing for? I think there is, and I, uh, I'll give you one uh, successful example. As part of tax reform, Republicans actually repealed the individual <laughs> mandate Yay! for Obamacare. <laughs> and this is really where health care reform right. starts. But we can't stop there. So the individual mandate is gone. A lot of people also don't realize this, but that's not enough. We need to get a handle on what's driving the cost of health care. And that means giving the individual Americans more choice over their own health care. Instead of the government operating a massive health insurance company, but by the way, they do very poorly, Steve was pointing out the high fraud rates and the high overpayments that we see in, in, in the government health care programs. 150 billion a year. 150 yeah, billion. Yeah, it's a huge. Year. So there's a lot that you can cut without really affecting health care quality. In fact, I believe that if we make the right reforms, bringing more market-based forces into the health care sector, we can improve the quality of health care and do so at lower cost. This should be a no-brainer. I like I like what Trump came out with this week. I thought it was fantastic. You know, we as conservatives should be. I've always said we need the three C's in healthcare. We need cost control. We need competition, and we need um, uh, cost yeah. control, competition, choice, choice. Choice. And you know, if you give people choice on their plans, and you allow greater competition through interstate, you know, and things like that, where people can buy from a multiple a multitude of plans. I mean, we know this as conservatives when 
Wait, what's the old Geico commercial? You know, when people, when country, companies compete, you know, it lowers prices for people. It's a good thing. So those three things, I think, will have a dramatic impact on lowering um, healthcare costs. I like this idea, on, you know, Social Security of, you know, gradually raising the retirement age, but then letting young people put some of that money. I mean, young people are going to be putting about 10% of their paycheck into a system that's not going to pay them. Uh, you know, you'll be lucky, you're just a young kid. <laughs> you're going to be lucky if you get anything, you know? So I'm a boomer, so you're going to be paying all this money. So those kinds of things of just looking at other options and getting out of this. I mean, we're using basically an old fashioned uh, defined benefit program in social security. Who uses those anymore? I mean, right? No private sector company does. Why not have a 401k plan? And I think even bigger picture, there's been a lot of momentum for budget process reform. Uh, and so, you know, look, we need rules in place that actually encourage different outcomes. We can focus on the individual policy areas, but at the end of the day, our elected officials have to be incentivized to actually take actions that are going to result in the outcomes that we want to see. And so, you know, maybe we can actually get some budget reforms that would actually put in place rules that uh, end up with different results down the road. Now, they I have a great, by the way, I want to interrupt yeah. for a second. I want to brag on this guy. They have an awesome <laughs> website where they're actually, you know, recording how much spending each and one of these congressmen is, is voting for. I mean, we need to get That's that. Right. Spend out yeah, That's right. SpendingTracker.org. So it's been about three years in the works. We've literally digitized all the estimates of uh, uh, spending estimates of various pieces of legislation and cross reference them with everyone's voting record. So you can literally go in, punch in your rapper senator or a zip code, and see exactly how much they voted for, what that spending has gone towards, and how they rank relative to other members of Congress. So it's an incredible powerful tool and I think it, it breaks down the sort of the problem that we've had for so long which is that we know government spends so much but we don't really know who to hold accountable for it and so now you can actually go and say well wait a minute my congressman has spent X and here's why and you actually have the means to confront him or her about that so um, I think it's a game changer and I think that's the direction we need to move now I speaker Ryan today appointed his uh, his members of the super new super committee that, uh, that yeah. they've created. Who are they? Do you know? To help. Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember <laughs> okay. specifically all of them. I haven't them seen that list yet. Hand, but but uh, you mentioned budget process reform. I think so many Americans think oh, Washington is just so broken. There's no way to fix it. Yep. So tell us a little bit about what an ideal scenario is in both of your worlds, uh, how that would end up. Yeah, I think we need to make Congress work again. That's my new slogan, okay. make Congress work again. <laughs> and uh, one of the ways to do that is to actually tie some of their pay to their performance. If they don't pass a budget, they shouldn't get paid. And um, in fact, our president, yes. um, Ms. K. Coles James, put out an op-ed on this on a Daily Signal recently about making Congress work like the rest of us do. If you don't do your job, you don't get paid. So we need to hold uh, lawmakers accountable. What we need is a spending limit. The debt limit continues to be raised. They've waived it, suspended it. Doesn't? It's not even around anymore. We need a spending limit, something that controls spending before it goes out the door. And if they overspend, I think then we should withhold their pay. And Ramina's right. You know, there's this great chart of uh, back in 2000, in 2008, what happened to the debt of many countries. And uh, in the United States, where we don't really have any sort of limit, we saw our debt to GDP just skyrocket. Uh, and then if you look at like countries like Switzerland or Sweden, for example, where they had these restrictions in place, their debt actually remained pretty constant. And so the lesson, I think, is that these rules matter a lot. And by imposing rules that actually um, work toward these kinds of outcomes, um, that's, that's the name of the game. It's not just about electing a few new people. It's about actually getting rules in place that can, can, uh, can result in better outcomes. I like the idea of, I'm going to take go even a step further than these guys. I mean, you know, you talk about changing the culture of Congress. Well, obviously, we need to do that. But where is the pressure going to come from? It really has to come from the people in the states. And, you know, our old boss, Jim DeMint, is now leading an effort to try to get states to uh, weigh in and, and maybe a constitutional convention. I don't even know what Heritage's official position on that. But I do know if states rise up and create the pressure on Congress, uh, you know, whether it's a balanced budget requirement, a spending limit, that I'm all in favor of that, and that means grassroots people around the country have to get you know yes. very involved. Of course, yeah. You know. That's what Obviously. happened in 2011. We saw the rise of right. the Tea Party, the, exactly. and yep. we got one of the biggest budget deals, That's right. the Budget Control Act, that actually cut spending. Right. That is what what helped drive down spending. We had a sequester in 2013. We even noticed that spending was cut. Steve was making the point. Mm -hmm. It was a three percent reduction. Most federal agencies can live that with that easily. They yeah. can do a thirty percent reduction. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know, it is interesting. I mean, if you look, I just did this big study on coming out of the recession, you know, 2008 and 9. And what private businesses did, you know, they were over leveraged like the government is. They were spending too much. They were fat and happy. And they were, private businesses were forced to cut their spending 
focus on profitability, you know, become almost ruthlessly efficient. So a lot of businesses cut 25, 30, 40 percent out of their, you know, out of their expenditures to become profitable. The idea that a government agency could do that, you know, is almost totally alien to Washington, but we really do. I mean, we say three or four percent, literally these agencies could cut 20 percent of their budget if they got serious about efficiency, but they don't have an incentive to do it. And you know, look, in your in your household, right, if you're having budget troubles, you don't go and ask your boss to, you know, up for a massive so raise, yeah. right? Yeah. What you do is you cut back on those expenditures, and not just on that Starbucks coffee, right? You fundamentally reassess the expenses that you have, and then and then try to make those cuts from there, right? And that's, as I think, the lesson that we have for the federal government is that you need to ultimately examine all these expenses and decide what are the things that we could do without and actually think about them in terms of trade-offs instead of this sort of Santa Claus mentality that exists of <laughs> let's just spend on everything and, uh, and make everyone happy. Well, Rob, if 20% of the people at the Department of Labor got laid off, would, that, would you lose any sleep? <laughs> I personally <laughs> No, I mean, but seriously, but we see, really have to think. Yeah, so you had such a positive effect on, on the President Trump uh, on his tax plan. You and, and Art Laffer and Steve huh? Forbes. Uh, you know, and, and uh, there's a fourth uh, that I'm, I'm Oh, Larry getting. Kudlow. Larry Kudlow. Yeah. Uh, how can you, wh wh where do you see him coming into play here? Because when he gets behind something, as we saw. You mean Trump? Trump. Right. Was you, was you, I mean, he talked about it today in his speech at CPAC. I mean, he was very clear that he had a specific vision for what he wanted to see happen in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And then he helped, uh, you know, propel it forward with momentum. So when it comes to these other issues, what do you think he can, he will embrace? What are you talking to him about? Uh, trying uh, to get him to that's a about? really good question. I mean, we'll find out whether he has a commitment to this. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Does he committed to, you know, taking the tough steps that are necessary to cut spending? He said he was. You know, when he was, on, you know, he remember he said I could balance the budget with one hand behind, right. you know, right. uh, his back. Um, so uh, I don't know. We'll have to see, but we need to really put the. That's why heritage is so important in this fight. You know, these these guys don't want to take on the spending problem because that's a really hard thing to do. And you know what Romina is doing and what your guys are doing and keeping the focus on you know cutting spending, I think is so critically important. But I think it's going to have to be forced on Trump, frankly. Okay. Yeah. Although although to the to the president's credit, if you look at that budget, right, there were a lot of great ideas in the president's budget. Yeah. Now we know that's, that's just sort of a blueprint. And uh, where do you get those ideas? <laughs> 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 but there's a, there's a lot to, to look at there that's very positive, right? I mean, you look at agriculture reform, for example, right? Reducing some agriculture subsidies is another, is another example. So, and we um, are going to have the farm bill this that's year. Right. So that's that right. is yeah. an immediate opportunity. If the other right. opportunity that comes along with, ag, with the, yeah, the ag bill or farm subsidies is that welfare reform is, yes. is tied into sure. that because food stamps are actually funded in the farm bill. So it's an opportunity to do welfare reform, help Americans get back to work. I think work requirements are so important. Also for Medicaid, that's another area where they can work really uh, I'll well. I'll throw out another one. You know, um, we have literally trillions of dollars of assets right beneath us, mm -hmm. oil, gas, and now this big issue of metal, metals and minerals. And you know, I was just looking at this new data. We're dependent on China and Russia to get uh, you know, some of the precious metals that are necessary for technology, for defense systems. I mean, that's ridiculous. We right. have more of this stuff than any other country, and yet we can't. So we should be, why not do this? Have a system where we go for our oil and gas and, and metals, not on you know, environmentally sensitive land, and then use the revenues that we, in the, you know, from the royalties of that to help pay down the debt. Are you I mean, guys have a problem with that? There, there are a lot of examples. I mean, let's look at flood insurance, right? Disaster relief. We've got a Pentagon audit coming up. I mean, the reality is there's examples everywhere that we can look to, and I think many that the president has been in favor of. So I'm, I'm optimistic in that regard, for sure. We're well, certainly here to help him do it. You are, and I want to give, give you both an opportunity to, to make a plug for, for the work you're doing. So tell us again the website that you're sure, encouraging yeah. our listeners to go to. Yeah, so it's spendingtracker.org, uh, and it literally, just like I said, punch in your zip code or uh, search for your member of Congress and uh, see exactly what they've spent. and. Uh, and uh, hopefully encourage them to spend less in the future. And Romina, we have a great resource in, in our federal yes. budget and pictures. Tell them about that and any other yes. things. Yes, uh, we have doing. a website, uh, federalbudgetandpictures.com, where you can get visual representations of the federal budget. And you can also take our quiz. It's only got four questions. You can do it 30 seconds. It's a hard quiz, I gotta share. say. <laughs> <laughs> you can share your results. And if you want to see the budget that helped influence the President Trump's budget, I recommend to you Blueprint for Balance. Well, great. Well, Steve, Romina, thank Jonathan, thanks so much for, <laughs> thank you. for joining thank you us for today on The Daily Signal. <laughs> we'll you. be back with more videos soon. <laughs> thanks, everyone.